Hey, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, it's Community Matters. And today we're going to talk about whatever happens to the inter island passenger and cargo ferries in Hawaii. Uh, we have Mike Hansen of Shippers Council to help us with that. Good morning, Mike. Thank you for showing, appearing on our show. Morning, Jay. Nice to be back with you. So let's talk about the uh, inter island ferries or steamers, as the case may be. You know, for many, many decades before statehood, we had these uh, steamers that plied the islands. They carried uh, passengers and cargo, and they were the lifeblood of the connection between the islands. In those days, I think we were better connected than we are today. Can you talk about that for a minute, just to get the, the sort of the economic environment, the, the transportation environment, if you will? Yeah, the uh, ocean transportation inter-island uh, in in the pre-statehood era, uh, say from 1883 until 1947, was operated by a company known as Inter-Island Steam Navigation. And they operated with four uh, combination passenger cargo vessels, uh, and they called it many of the small ports around the islands, including ports that are no longer serviced today. Mm. Um, However, uh, having grown up in Hawaii in the 1950s, I heard from many of the older folk at the time that uh, they were very happy that uh, the airlines had come to Hawaii and they could now fly rather than take a miserable ship from place to place. So it wasn't all a, a rice and roses as, uh, as, it, as it may be have seemed, you know, from, from our perspective many years later. That was romantic, wasn't it? It was, um, it was a, a, a trip out on the ocean, get out of your little house, uh, get to see some distance, you know, get to enjoy the environment. Um, uh, from, and, from, and, you know, and, and talk to your friends, uh, whatever it was. Yeah. From the stories I heard, most people got violently sick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and you have to remember that... Uh, they carried livestock on board on the deck. Oh no! <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> but it was cheap, wasn't it? Anybody could go, and it was just a few bucks. So, so it, it, there was no economic barrier to people traveling among the islands. Yeah, well, it was cheap. I said, and you could take deck steerage. Yes, right. Along with the animals. Right. And the, yeah, they were not luxurious ships for sure. <laughs> it sounds like fun. Boy, I tell you, if they had something like that now, I mean, I, as, a, as a forever curious person, I would definitely take that trip. So anyway, sometime around the, the advent of uh, what? Uh, Inter-island air travel, which was before statehood, right? Um, right. The, that, uh, that occurred after World War II. And also, uh, inner island steam depended not only on, on passengers, but also cargo. Right. And the old steamships were very inefficient. And they were displaced by the cargo barge service that was operated by Young Brothers. Yeah, so they went out. They went out. They were no longer around. It, in, it 19, in 1947, inner island steamship went out of business. Yeah, okay. And so since then, we've had, uh, I remember Sea Flight, remember Sea Flight in the 70s? Yeah, Sea um, Flight yeah. operated from 75 until 79. Yeah. And they operated, they operated with three Boeing hydrofoils. As I recall, yeah. Sea Flight was, um, was um, a maintenance headache. Uh, uh, and yeah, they were that hull wasn't really built for Hawaii waters. They were unable to keep the vessels in service uh, due to the uh, extreme sea conditions between the islands. Yeah, they but it was fun. I took a trip on sea flight to Maui one time. I took my bicycle with me. I had a wonderful time on sea flight. It was, it was very touchy-feely. You were right out there. You could put your hand out and feel the spray. Right. Yeah, the, uh, and it was uh, basically just a passenger service. They didn't carry any cargo. Yeah, they, they did and, carry uh, bicycles, yeah. so. They operated three uh, vessels, and uh, they had a service to Nawili Wili and Kauai from Honolulu, and then they operated from Honolulu to Lahaina, and then uh, Kauai High on the Big Island, and back. Yeah. 
And, we enjoyed uh, that for a while. It's too bad it went out of business. So from, uh, what did you say, 1979 until Super Ferry, there was nothing. There was no right, ferry. Right, uh, and the uh, sea flight vessels were sold to a Hong Kong owner for mm. operation on the Pearl River Delta, mm. where you had a basically an inland waterway type of uh, situation. And they ran uh, casino passengers from Hong Kong to Macau. Ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> and, the, and the water there was probably, you know, more appropriate for flat, that hole. Yes, it no. was an estuary. So it was yeah. a relatively calm water. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now, what, what uh, led to Super Ferry, though? Now, we didn't have anything. And right. you had to take a, and, and, and the air, the air uh, uh, tickets got more and more expensive over the years. Um, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure when, when Aloha Airlines went out of business, but you had for several years a monopoly with Hawaiians. So people were really discouraged with the cost of traveling, to see their family and friends on neighboring right. islands. But there was another, there's another important aspect to the sea flight story. And that is that hydrofoils and also hovercraft that went on a cushion of air, mm -hmm. those have all been displaced now by the fast ferry uh, catamaran and trimaran configuration. So those vessels don't exist anywhere any, any longer. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah. so that, that means that we had to design a new hull. Uh, it means that we had to find a new model. Yeah. Right, and that was done uh, primarily in Australia by two companies. One is called Austal, and the other one is INCAT. INCAT is located on island of Tasmania, and Austal is in Western Australia, just outside of Perth. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the new modern uh, fast ferry designs have come from. Okay, so can, are you familiar with, can you talk to us about, uh, you know, how the super ferry got started uh, and why? Uh, well, yeah, she, they operated from late uh, 2007 until early 2009. And they basically operated for about a year. Mm -hmm. uh, they operated one large, what, what's known as a fast ferry, uh, the Alakai, uh, basically from Honolulu to Maui. Uh, they built those, they built actually two vessels, one that was never delivered to uh, Super Ferry. And that cost them $180 million. Uh, that, that is the one that was not delivered. Uh, no, that was for both. Okay. Yeah, so for the two ships, uh, 90 million a piece, 180 million for the two. Uh, the cost of harbor facilities that the state paid for was around 50 million dollars. Yeah, and that and that was the um, and that was the the, the Achilles heel. Um, because yes, those, but uh, that, that 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 payment by the state, the, the construction of those harbor facilities. And you can see it as you as you. Uh, yeah, I've spoken to out. Michael Lilly quite extensively on this subject. And uh -huh. he was the attorney general for Linda Lingle at the time that this all happened. And it's his contention that the, uh, uh, that the courts went further than they ever had before in interpreting the Hawaii environmental protection law. And yeah, I that, agree with that. And it didn't have to go that far. Yeah, and, 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 and what and, they and, found yeah. was that, uh, the, you know, that uh, the, the environmental impact statement uh, had not been obtained. Uh, Linda Lingle had given uh, Super Ferry a pass for it. Um, and uh, the, yeah, other, but, the other salient the, point that yeah, we were they're, they're, about. According to Lily, it's a little deeper than that. Uh, basically, the harbor improvements uh, should have, would have normally all been covered by existing environmental impact statements that the Harbors Division, Department of Transportation had already done. And that these kind, this magnitude of harbor imp improvements had been done previously without an impact statement. And the and court, it, the Supreme Court of the state found- Yeah, um, I know, that the, but it's a, it's a very liberal decision. The Supreme Court of the state found that that, that expense by the state was a trigger for the EIS requirement. I understand that, but that was uh, what uh, Lily's point is, 
is that uh, the state had done this kind of harbor improvements in the past under existing impact statements and hadn't been forced uh, to do a new impact statement for this uh, for these purposes. In addition to that, uh, the reach of the uh, uh, of the decision went beyond just the facilities. They got into the impact on the environment of the vessels operating at sea. And that was very much beyond the usual scope of these kinds of considerations. Well, there was a lot of protest. People were concerned about the whales, even though the ferry did not run in the area of the whales and didn't have to. Uh, and then there were people who um, opposed it because of the, I called it the berries on the boots, that there were invasive species that were being carried of from course, island yeah. to island, which was ridiculous because you could do the same berries on the same boots taking an airplane. Right. Um, and they also reason, wanted the cars to be washed, especially the undercarriage of vehicles. To yeah, go even on though the there was no requirement and, for that on, the, on, on Young Brothers barges. That's correct. So, I mean, they piled a lot of stuff on the super ferry that uh, other uh, forms of transportation have not had to comply with. Yeah, it makes you think, and a lot of people do think, uh, that Young Brothers and the rent car companies didn't want uh, people traveling by super ferry and they didn't want people taking their cars by super ferry. And so they, you know, politically stood in the way. And it sure seems like that. It right. sure seems like there were political forces here that pulled the rag, rug out from under. Right. Um, and then they it's uh, so hard for the super ferry to operate. Uh, they spent all their time in court for the year you mentioned. Uh, they ultimately, when the Supreme Court stopped them a second time in a second case, they, they, they gave up. They folded. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Uh, so that was, you know, in, in terms of public policy, that was bad public policy, because then what happened is we didn't have the super ferry right. and it was radioactive. Uh, so can you talk about um, Joe Tsuki and what happened after the super ferry folded? Um, I'm not aware of that. Well, I can tell you that Joe Tsuki from Maui, right? He was, a, right. What was he was the um, speaker. At one time, he's been, he was speaker a couple of different times. And he, at the time, following the demise of Super Ferry, he tried for a number of years to introduce bills and resolutions to try to resurrect it. You know, but the, the truth of the matter is, after Super Ferry died and uh, Lehman Brothers lost a couple of hundred million dollars in the process, nobody was going to, uh, you know, invest in a, in a private venture of this nature again. And right. one, of the, one of the officials of Super Ferry told me one time that, that if there was ever going to be a ferry again in Hawaii, it would have to be the government that built it. Uh, sort of the way the government builds these ferry, ferry lines all around the continental United States. Right. Uh, but the government, the government is uh, incapable of building it here in Hawaii. Right. Uh, the investors' uh, uh, losses were reported to be about $85 million in capital money that they put in. And total losses... Uh, are around $300 million, considering all parties. Mm -hmm. It's a big... A big Nobody was money. going back to that. Nobody was going to try to do that again. No. Uh, everybody anyway, lost so much money. Uh, then also there was the Molokai Ferry that operated from Lahaina... Before we go to Lahaina. that, I, before we go to that, I, I just want to talk about the, the, the public reaction the public reaction to the ferry. Uh, I thought that was fairly remarkable at the time. People on the neighbor islands, uh, local people, uh, protested against the ferry. They protested because of the whales. They protested because of the berries on the boots. Um, and uh, I don't think they, uh, the protesters understood what was really happening because they were shooting themselves in the foot. Now, after the demise of Super Ferry, they would pay you know, way more on an airplane to get there. And they couldn't take their car. They'd have to rent a car at the other side. Uh, and the, the guys in diversified agriculture could not move their goods uh, from, from whatever island they were on to any other island. So yeah, the result no, I, was the people I, who had protested, you know, were themselves injured by the process. Um, sure. I, 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 thought I think that a that lot was, of the people that were protesting the super ferry 
simply didn't want any more development. And they saw the super ferry as a means of additional traffic and, and development. Well, yeah, and that was a very interesting statement because I, whether they understood they were saying or not is they didn't want people on their island. But the fact is people were coming to their island by airplane all the time, by the thousands, hundreds of thousands. So this would not have been a problem. The people they were keeping out, and this is so interesting, it's a, it's a social experiment thing. The people they wanted to keep out were the people from the other islands, local people. So the people on Maui didn't want the people from Oahu there. And that was really extraordinary. These were, you know, if they were objecting to tourists, they were not achieving anything because the tourists just took the airplane. It was only a few bucks for them. Um, but they were, they were successful in keeping out other local people from Oahu. This is the same kind of thing that came up uh, in the, uh, the extraordinary um, phenomenon about, uh, about wind, wind energy on, um, on um, Lanai. Uh, the people there did not want to give wind energy to Oahu. Uh, they wanted to keep the islands separate. And, and, I, and I felt from both of those phenomena, both of them were so inappropriate for the Aloha state. Well, yeah, that's, uh, but you've got that anti-development um, contingent out there and they are gonna be vocal, very vocal about their ideas. And um, I agree that some of the opposition to the super prairie was short-sighted. Well, some of it came, I mean, I'm just uh, repeating what I've heard so many times. Some of it came from Young Brothers. Uh, Young Brothers did not want the competition uh, for cargo and cars. That's very lucrative. And so right. they stood in the way. Yeah, uh, that may or may not be. I'm not sure that that was a major factor, but uh, the Super Ferry just uh, simply didn't have the capacity to carry that much cargo. So I don't see it as being a major threat to uh, Young Brothers or having been a major threat to Young Brothers. Uh, to go on with our litany of the... Uh, ferry operations in Hawaii, uh, the Molokai Ferry that operated from Lahaina to Kanakakai. Uh, that operated actually for 30 years from 86 until 2016. Uh, they, uh, they used one vessel, the Molokai Princess, which was a, a mono hull, a, a conventional vessel, uh, not a fast ferry. Uh, it took them about uh, an hour and a half to get across the Pailolo Channel between Maui and, uh, and Molokai and into Karakakai Harbor. And that was started with a $30,000 a month state subsidy that continued until 2012. And for the next four years, they attempted to operate without a subsidy lost a million dollars, and then finally shut down. Um, you know, Mike, I didn't, I didn't see that of any, as any consequence at all. I, I okay. took that, uh, that uh, ferry, if you want to call it a ferry, a number of times. It did not have high capacity. It did not have high speed. It did not have any cargo capability. That's correct. It was a tourist boat. It was a tourist boat. A right. tourist in Lanai paid well, to was... go to... Con a tourist in Lanai pay to go to um, kind of, what is it to, in Maui? From no, no, and, no, and a tourist in Maui pay to go to Lanai. No, no, uh, no. That's a that's a different service. The the uh, the Sea Link Molokai ferry was just between Lahaina and Kanakakai Molokai. Okay. Yeah. All right. There and, was another one then. You're yeah, right. Uh, yeah, there was I'll, another I'll, one then from Lanai to uh, to Kanakakai. I'll, 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 I'll explain that to you. Uh, one of the problems with the uh, uh, with the Molokai Prince uh, Molokai Princess service is they had to cross the Pailolo Channel between Maui and Molokai, and 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 typically people it was a pretty rough trip and a lot of people got sick. One of the ideas of the Molokai ferry was to give people living on Molokai the opportunity to travel to Lahaina and work in the hotels in West Maui. But most people found that they didn't have the ability to endure the, the back and forth. Because it's also of the very, an expensive way to get to work. Yeah, and it's also a rough trip. 
Yeah. But when they had the subsidy, it worked. But after they lost the subsidy, it was gone. The the, the uh, service you're talking about is the Lanai Passenger Ferry, operated by Expeditions. They've got a high speed, uh, 55 foot catamaran that operates. It used to operate five trips a day between Lahaina and Maneli Bay on Lanai. They're down I, to. Two. I didn't think that was a catamaran. The uh, I thought I think it was a you know a, a single hull um, steel vessel. Uh, uh, the that vessel I, they have, that I took a couple of times. Yeah, the vessel they're operating now is an aluminum hull uh, catamaran. Mm. Okay. They make they make that was that was strictly tourism. Right. And, but there's Lanai residents that use it. But it's an example of a commercially successful ferry service in Hawaii. Is it and, still operating? Uh, yes. And it's, yeah. uh, they're down to two trips a day due to the COVID. Yeah. But, but you know, Mike, uh, these, these, the trip from Lanai uh, and the trip from Molokai both really seem like small potatoes to me. Um, well, they, they are, but I mean. not carrying hundreds or thousands of passengers. Right. They're not, carrying cars, they're not carrying cargo. Uh, they really do nothing for the commerce of the state. I mean, or very little. Right. And uh, you know, where, I, where I get off on this is um, that we, we, don't, we don't have a ferry because we shot ourselves in the foot. Um, and uh, it was tragic. Uh, it still is tragic. Um, we need a ferry. We're, we're, an, we're an island state. We're water bound. And there is absolutely no movement anywhere not in the legislature, not in the business community, um, not among the delegation, um, not among any officials. Uh, Joe Suki is long gone, and there's nobody even calling for it except me. And you? Are you calling for it? Uh, in a way, but uh, it's got to be done smartly and the right way. Um, How do you do it smartly in the right way? Uh, yeah, that, that is the question, isn't it? Uh, do you realize that there was a major movement back in the 1950s and early 60s for a state-operated ferry system? Uh, no, I did not know that. What happened? I guess it didn't uh, work. It was, it was uh, promoted by a guy by the name of John Holton, H-U-L. Oh, sure. Holton's Ferry. Sure. Exactly. And he was known as Hawaii's Mr. Ferry. He was born in San Francisco and, and uh, came to Hawaii in 1950. And he began promoting the idea of inter island ferry in 1956. And uh, his vision was he had grown up on San Francisco Bay and had seen the ferries operating there across the bay, especially before they built the bridges, and thought that would be wonderful for Hawaii. Well, yeah, but it's history. I mean, it's a, it's a, a little, a little bit of a little bit of interesting history. My question to you is, what do we have to do um, to um, it's deploy a, it's a, a ferry it's system important. among the islands? Yeah, but it's important because he got a he, uh, and actually he became a state senator, and he became a Senate president for two sessions, all riding on the back of uh, the idea of a ferry. So there was, he was pretty influential at the time. Uh, he got an, uh, he enacted uh, a bill in uh, 1963 relating to the Hawaii state ferry system. That's still on the books. It authorizes the state to own and operate a ferry system. And- Are you uh, suggesting the state could go under that statute now and absolutely. start a ferry system? It's still on the books. So it okay, let me go back to my question, which you didn't answer yet. Uh, and that is, how do we do it? Uh, back in 2016, there, was a, there were nine ferry bills submitted to the legislature. Uh, one bill uh, came out, was enacted as uh, Act 196 of 2016. Uh, and the... Uh, required the Department of Transportation to conduct a feasibility study of establishing inter-island and intra-island ferry system. That's remarkable because they already had an operating ferry with Super Ferry. So now they have to have a study to see 
It wasn't super ferry a steady itself. And uh, the uh, the parameters were to, to look at it in in terms of the Washington State and Alaska State ferry systems. They appropriated fifty thousand dollars for the study. DOT. Uh, uh, submitted a report to the legislature for the 2018 session. Uh, we gave testimony at the time, and we uh, and we recommended that they also consider a conventional ferry, uh, known as a Ropax ferry, a roll-on, roll-off passenger ferry of the kind they operate in uh, Europe, and that they use foreign operating models rather than US operating models, because most of the ocean going ferry operations in the world, in fact, are foreign. And uh, we, I contacted a number of, of people who have done this kind of work in the past and got their estimates for consulting on a ferry study. And you'd need about a million dollars to do a, a, a proper study. The uh, DOT submitted their report uh, it was limited to the consideration of fast ferries only and only considered U.S. operating models, especially the Washington and Alaska state. Uh, they have a listing of 73 previous studies that were done on a Hawaii ferry system. And those studies go all the way back to 1956 and run through 2014 an enormous amount of work. Uh, the, the early ones, of course, are all related to um, Halton's Ferry. Uh, they investigated eight different routes in response to the legislative intent. And their conclusion was the inter-island, inter-county, intra-island ferry systems are infeasible. Well, that's, I guess that's the conclusion of our show. Um, we have shot ourselves in the foot. We do not have a way to get around on water in the state, even though we're an island state. And there is no, uh, there is no living idea, living initiative to do this. There is no champion to do this. Um, and uh, after all this time, it is very unlikely we will have a ferry for so many reasons, uh, especially including our... Uh, our, our, um, our, our, our technique of shooting ourselves in the foot. Anyway, thanks for visiting with us, Mike. Thanks for giving us the history of that. I'm, I'm not uh, encouraged uh, that we will ever have a ferry, but I think it's important to point out to people um, that we could have had a ferry. We did have a ferry for a while. Um, and we have been thinking about it for a long time, according but we do not the bank, have the according, political will to do that. We're out of time, Mike. We got to okay. go now. But thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. Aloha. Bye.